We'll be reading the long passage from Romans this morning. You've probably heard this passage before, but I would guess many of us, if not all of us, have not read it from the message paraphrase. And I like the poetic way in which it provides a new perspective on this passage. So let us turn our attention to this reading from Romans chapter 5, verses 12 through 21 from the message. You know the story of how Adam landed us in this dilemma we're in. First sin, then death, and no one exempt from either sin or death. That sin disturbed relations with God in everything and everyone. But the extent of the disturbance was not clear until God spelled it out in detail to Moses. So death, this huge abyss separating us from God, dominated the landscape from Adam to Moses. Even those who didn't sin precisely as Adam did by disobeying a specific command of God still had to experience this termination of life, this separation from God. But Adam, who got us into this, also points ahead to the one who will get us out of it. Yet the rescuing gift is not exactly parallel to the death-dealing sin. If one man's sin put crowds of people at the dead-end abyss of separation from God, Just think what God's gift poured through one man, Jesus Christ, will do. There's no comparison between that death-dealing sin and this generous, life-giving gift. The verdict on that one sin was the death sentence. The verdict on the many sins that followed was this wonderful life sentence. If death got the upper hand through one man's wrongdoing, can you imagine the breathtaking recovery life makes, sovereign life, and those who grasp with both hands this wildly extravagant life gift, this grand setting everything right that one man, Jesus Christ, provides? Here it is in a nutshell. Just as one person did it wrong and got us in all this trouble with sin and death, another person did it right and got us out of it. But more than just getting us out of trouble, he got us into life. One man said no to God and put many people in the wrong One man said yes to God and put many in the right. All that passing laws against sin did was produce more lawbreakers, but sin didn't and doesn't have a chance in competition with the aggressive forgiveness we call grace. When it's sin versus grace, grace wins hands down. All sin can do is threaten us with death, and that's the end of it. Grace, because God is putting everything together again through the Messiah, invites us into life. A life that goes on and on and on, world without end. Let us join together in prayer. (coughs) Almighty God, we are so grateful as we gather here this morning and we carry the baggage and the weight with us of what our life has meant and this old life has been about as we carry the weight of guilt and sin and trespasses and failures and fears and labels into this place, we are so grateful to hear this message. So Lord, in this time, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us that we might be truly set free from all that holds us down and binds our hearts. Open up our minds, our hearts, and our souls that we might hear your word spoken to us today, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. (coughs) If you've gotten to know me, you know that I enjoy working with my son's baseball team. That might be a bit of an understatement, right? But I really enjoy working on coaching and training the kids not to just be better baseball players, but also to become good people. One of the many extra roles that comes along with the volunteer responsibilities that I've taken on at the complex where I coach and as a board member there is where... I could attend extra work days and practices and tryouts for all the kids. We just had them a couple of weeks ago. And as one of the extra people there at these tryouts and practices, I can help with drills or I can help keep the children disciplined and in line and, and moving around between the drills. And I have to confess, this role of disciplinarian of other people's kids doesn't come naturally to me. It, felt very uncomfortable at first. I can't say I've really warmed up to it, but I started to understand uh, more the need for this when I had uh, two kids on my team one season. We'll call one of them Kevin, and we'll call the other one Josh, just to protect their identity. (laughs) 
And though they are both great kids and they have great parents, for whatever reason, these two could not get along at all in the dugout or during practice. They just, they could not get along. I don't know what it was. Both of them said, we're friends. And every coach and every parent on the team said, well then act like it. During one particular game that moved at a fairly brisk pace, they both happened to be on the bench in the same inning by themselves twice. Now normally kids only had to sit the bench once, but we got all the innings in this, in this game and they had to be there twice. Now I should have known that this was not a good idea. It was far enough into the season, I should have known it was a bad idea. And in fact, my wife Amanda told me at the beginning of the season, do not, I mean it, do not put them on the bench together at all this season. Just don't do it. And not only had I broken uh, that rule, I had done it twice in one game. And so the first inning, our team is fielding, and I look over in the dugout, and what do I see but Kevin sitting on top of Josh in the dirt. I stopped paying attention to the game, and I walked into the dugout, and let's say I had a friendly conversation with them. They wouldn't take it that way, but a friendly conversation with them about why you don't do that. And at the end of it, I said something along the lines of, uh, now don't you ever do that again or I will kick you out of this dugout and you won't get to play baseball. In fact, I won't let you sit in here during games if you keep that up. That should solve things, right? That, That should tell them very strongly don't, I'm not going to do that anymore. I want to keep playing. Well, the next time in the game, they found themselves uh, sitting in there by themselves, right? What do you think I looked over and saw? Now, if you were to guess Kevin sitting on top of Josh in the dirt, again, you'd be right. <laughs> I pulled them aside. I, in fact, I pulled them out of the dugout, outside of the gates to the field, And I said to them, what are you thinking? And after uh, talking sternly to them and uh, saying, after I yelled at you and then talked to you and you understood it was wrong, why would you do that again knowing I'm going to kick you out of here? Why would you do that? With all the innocence of childhood, Kevin looked up at me and said, because coach... You never told us what else to do when we were in here. So we play. And we're friends, and when we play, we wrestle. And when we wrestle, I'm bigger and I win. Hmm. That's when I figured out that it wasn't that these two were trying to break the rules and trying to fight with each other necessarily, but that they simply didn't know any better. And even when told what they were doing was wrong, They still kept doing it. They were never given anything else to do instead. Now, maybe it wouldn't have made a difference if I had coached them all season on when you're in the dugout, this is what you do instead. These are the games you can play and how you can treat each other. Maybe it wouldn't have made any difference and they would have wound up fighting each other and Kevin would have wound up sitting on Josh in the dirt. But in that moment, a sort of light bulb clicked on in my head. You see, I have a problem sometimes when I read the Bible, and it's been pointed out to me by a few of you and a bunch of other people in my life life over the year. Uh, It's a big problem, because when I'm reading something good, I get really excited about it. I mean, I get really excited, and I get really focused on it, and, and that happens to me all the time when I'm reading the letters of Paul, all the time. I read about how Christ died to forgive our sins, and I get... I just get amped up. That's great news. You see, I know all the sins I've committed. You might not, but I do. And there is nothing more exciting to me than hearing that they're forgiven. That's amazing. They're like heavy weights around my neck, and they build up over time, you know, and they start crushing my soul. I hope you can identify with some of this. And it's not just me. And it's not that I don't believe what Paul writes. It's that from time to time, I get further and further away from remembering what he writes, and so this is all building up on my soul, right? These weights, they keep adding to me. And and in fact, when I go out into the world, I don't just 
feel like I, I've committed a couple of sins or trespasses, but I also seem to pick up labels everywhere I go. I feel like I pick up labels, and, and these labels read things like not good enough, failure, weird, less than, inferior, stupid, and more. And it's not like someone walks around and slaps me on the back and I've got a new label, right? It's not like someone points at me and and calls me these things. But you know how it goes. Just from existing in our cultural ethos, just by rubbing elbows with each other, just by living in this this country, these words are out there for us to pick up as we rub shoulders with them. It's like they've multiplied and they have double-sided tape or they're static, right? You walk past them and they cling to you. And once they're on you, it's like they're there with Gorilla Glue. They're impossible to get off. Just from walking around, being in their vicinity, and you've picked them up, and before you know it, you've attracted and attached so many labels to yourself that you you can't even see straight. In the checkout line at the grocery store, you see a workout magazine, right? And there's someone on the front cover that not only is genetically gifted, but they've worked really hard to look that way, and all of a sudden, you never thought this before, but you say, man, am I ugly. Or you're watching Jeopardy, and a contestant who has studied for this for a long time comes out with an answer to one of the hardest questions that you've ever heard, and you say, wow, I would stink at this game. I'm so stupid. You're not trying to pick them up, and nobody said that to you, but there it is, right? They're just there for you to run into. The multitude of ways we pick up these labels, it increases every day with every interaction we have and every conversation we have. And every time we interact with entertainment, they're just there pouring at us, streaming at us, and some of them stick. And we carry them around. And so I read that in Christ all of our sins are forgiven, that they've been buried with Him, that our old self has been buried with Christ. Whatever we've picked up, it's all buried with Him, and it's gone. And I start screaming inside myself, Woohoo! Hallelujah! Thank you, Jesus! I get a little charismatic about it. Because all that weight and all of my failures and all of these labels that tell me that I will never be good enough, all these things that just kill my soul, right? All that nothingness that I carry, it's all dead and it's buried with Jesus. And it's gone. And so every time I read this, I get really excited. Because it's amazing news for all of us. And maybe you're like me. Maybe it's been a bit since you've heard that message. Maybe it's been a while since you considered just the overwhelming grace of Christ, the mercy of Christ that takes our sins. doesn't matter how big or how heavy takes our labels, doesn't matter what they say or how many, and buries them. And they're gone for good. Maybe it's been a while. Or maybe you've never heard that before. Or maybe you've never heard it quite like that. That all our sins and failures, however big they are, however heavy they are, however we acquired them, have been put to death with Jesus. Each and every one of them are gone. Now, you might be wondering how Jesus' death leads to shedding these labels. Well, these labels, they're the ones that tell you in every way that you're just not good enough for this, right? They're the things that separate you from God. You're just not good enough for what God's offering you. But you see, the thing about that is Jesus died for you while you were still carrying them around, and he didn't care what they said. He didn't care how bad they were or how many there were. It didn't matter to him because of God's immense love for you. And so those labels you've picked up, they don't matter. And Jesus doesn't see them, and his death knocks them off by saying, I don't care what you've picked up. Your old self with all of those is gone. You don't have to worry about it anymore. And I get excited, and I get really focused, and sometimes I forget. You see, here's the problem where I say I get too excited. Sometimes I forget that there's something after that. Sometimes I forget that, like, Kevin and Josh in the dugout, it's one thing to say, don't do that again now that you know it's wrong and I forgive you. Sometimes it's hard to remember that there's a, well, what now? What instead? What's next? Okay, my sins have been forgiven. They've fallen off me like old skin or like an exoskeleton from a molting snake. 
All that old nasty stuff has been crusted up and it's fallen away and it's buried in the ground and it's decomposing somewhere, but now what? And believe it or not, there are quite a large number of Christians who don't know how to answer that question. Believe it or not, there's a lot of people out there who believe in the forgiveness of sins, but that's all the farther they can get with this whole faith thing. And I find that very sad and a lot confusing. Because if it's just about forgiveness of sins, I have to be honest with you, I'm going to need to read this passage again tonight before I go to bed. Because at some point after I walk out of here today, I'm going to trespass somebody. There's going to be some new label that throws itself at me. I'm going to be with some eight and nine year olds again today, and I got to tell you, I'm going to need this again tonight. And I'm going to need it again tomorrow and the next day and the next day. And that's great. I love that it's already there, but I'll tell you something else about me that you might not know. I don't really like repetition. And so if I kept doing this every day and there was nothing else but this every day for the rest of my life here on earth, I'd eventually ask, what is the point? Over and over again, really? That's all there is? This is it? I love knowing that I'm forgiven. I love knowing I'm, I'm given a second chance and that I've got to stop, but, but come on, Jesus, what else am I supposed to do with my time here? Because all I know is sitting on that kid in the dirt. I don't know what else to do unless you give me something. Jesus dealt with this sort of question, I think, in his ministry. There's a story of the man in your Scripture quotes and notes that you may have heard before who was brought to Jesus by the man's friends, and he couldn't walk. Maybe he couldn't even move. Jesus looked at the man and said, your sins are forgiven. And that's awesome, right? We love that. Your sins are forgiven. And the religious leaders in the room said, well, what kind of blasphemy is that to say your sins are forgiven? And Jesus looked at them and asked, which is harder, to forgive sins or to say, get up and walk? And so he looked at the man and he said, stand up, Take your bed and go to your home. Jesus forgave the man of all of his sins, but I have to believe, because I've been there, that if that's all Jesus did that day, as great as it is, at some point that man's heart might grow hard again as the world passes him by as he can't get up off the mat. i got to believe that at some point there's going to be those labels that he had just shed in that moment were going to come back, and maybe twofold or tenfold onto him they would probably for me and so jesus did not just say your sins are forgiven and that's awesome and we celebrate that but he also said stand up and take your mat and go home jesus didn't just forgive his sins jesus gave this man a new future a new life a new way to live something else to do instead of what he'd always done before If we have the courage to keep reading Paul or the focus to get past that excitement of my sins are forgiven, then you'll see that Paul talks about this also. Paul tells us not just that we were delivered from something, but that we've been delivered to and for something. We've been delivered to a new life for Jesus Christ. We've been delivered from sin and to life. In this new life, we live for Jesus. The same life that was in Christ is now living through us for the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And what that means is not simply that what Christ did, we do, though it does mean that, but it also means that what Christ is doing, Christ is doing through us. It's a new life in Christ. As the body of Christ, it's Christ's life in us. So what Christ would have done in this world, the breaking in of the kingdom of God, all of the deliverance and all of the healing and all of the reconciliation and all of the preaching and all of the teaching ministries, all of it, Christ would do through us. If we are truly in Christ, and if our sins have truly been buried with Him no matter what they were or are or will be tomorrow morning, then we have also been raised with Him and been given a brand new life. Not some future life waiting for then, but a new life that started now through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit of God that is in Christ. You see, we've been raised to life for a purpose. We read it this morning in our scripture from Romans verse 18. Here it is in a nutshell. 
just as one person did it wrong and got us in all this trouble with sin and death, another person did it right and got us out of it. But more than just getting us out of it, he got us into life. More than just getting us out of trouble, he got us into life. Elsewhere in the epistles, the New Testament letters, and another letter attributed to Paul in Philippians, we read this. As long as I'm alive in this body, there is good work for me to do. Our sins weren't forgiven in the death of Christ so that we would have nothing to do and nothing to worry about. And that we could just sit back and say, I'm Teflon now. Instead, through Christ's resurrection and the outpouring of God's Holy Spirit, we have been raised to new life in Christ. It's not something that we await to receive one day. It's something that begins and us right now because we've been raised now to life for a purpose. Just like Kevin and Josh, if we get forgiven of our sins but are given nothing else to do, what do you think is going to happen to us? Sure, it might not be today, it might not be tomorrow, it might not be this week, but sooner or later we're going to keep returning to the same behaviors and the same life and the same mistakes we've been making over and over before. But, if we are truly forgiven of our sins and raised to a new life in Christ for a purpose, then we will realize every day that we are called to live for God. That there is good work for us to do to make the kingdom life that we have received a visible reality in this world and to share it with others. That's our calling, to live out this life that we have received through Christ for all the world to see and to experience. Now what does this mean? Well, it means that today's Communion Sunday, and we're already running short of time because I preach a lot, and you're going to have to sign up for the newsletter that Stephanie and I put out each week and that little red book in the pews because that's what I'm going to be talking about for the next couple of weeks in there, devotional. Let us pray. Almighty God, we are so grateful that it, with your death, Lord Jesus, you buried our sins and you cast away our labels. We are so grateful that we have this reminder, that we have this access, that we have the assurance of our forgiveness repeatedly, as often as we need it. And Lord, we are so grateful that you raised us to life as well, that you gave us something else to do, a new life to live, a new person to be, a new purpose to live for. Help us, Lord Jesus, not just to remember the forgiveness of our sins, but to embrace this life that you have given to us through your grace. In your name we pray. Amen.